Hi, I'm James McGuire, and today we're talking about artificial intelligence, how to get started with it, how companies are using it, and the role that data fabric plays in AI in the enterprise. To explore that, I'm joined by a very special guest. With me is Daniel Hernandez, General Manager, Data and AI at IBM. Daniel, very good to have you with us today. James, my pleasure. Happy Friday. And, and I see you are, you are, it looks like you may be in the middle of moving today. Are those sort of interesting? It looks like you probably have a lot going on. Uh, I do, you know, uh, personal life, getting in the way, not getting in the way of this interview. So certainly making time for you, the audience, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. Right. <laughs> good, good. So I think it's interesting, you know, artificial intelligence offers big, big competitive advantages. I think, you know, companies really can't compete fully without it uh, these days. And yet plenty of companies really struggle with deploying it. I think I read one statistic where something like only 4% of companies have a working uh, AI deployment. Maybe that's lower than it is, and maybe it's moved. Uh, so wh why, why is it so hard for companies? Look, so no matter the source of the statistic, we're not going to be satisfied until this stuff is pervasively deployed in all industries, in all companies. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, I would say the nature of the problem comes down to two basic issues. Okay. Number one, a business one, which is, try to apply AI against a problem that's not worth solving. It could be because we weren't explicit about the problem space, or it could be that we didn't examine it enough to, to, to have confidence that artificial intelligence could improve or deliver a solution to it. That's kind of easy stuff, it's basics. It, I would say as an industry, we're much better um, in, in applying this stuff to real problems versus doing experimentation for experimentation sake. Mm -hmm. The other problem that happens to, have, happens to be around data. The vast majority of the implementation of artificial intelligence systems uses a technique called supervised learning. Supervised learning depends upon data. And the truth is data remains too much in silos in the typical enterprise. Um, and the current technique in Vogue, which is copy all your data, put it in a cloud data warehouse, isn't going to do anything to really solve that problem. So we need better methods to access data wherever it is, put it to work in support of things like data science, which is what you need to, to build artificial intelligence systems, mm -hmm. and do so with proper tip protections and lifecycle management. And if we want to copy it, let's go ahead and copy it. That's called the data fabric. So I think the, the data problem is a very real problem. The good news is the data fabric really offers a way out for us to address the data silo problem through an altogether different approach than what we've explored in the past. Do you think my my uh, portrait that, that companies are really struggling out there is accurate or, or maybe that it's not as big a problem as it was maybe a couple of years ago? Oh, they are. So I think most people are smart enough now to realize spending money uh, against a problem that is ill-defined, probably not a good use of capital and resources. Mm -hmm. The second nature of the problem is, so if you were to take data science, a discipline of basically building artificial intelligence, typically through things like statistical machine learning models, deep learning models, any, any other variety of the like. Building the thing is one thing, building a model is one thing. To do a prediction, to do customer segmentation, mm -hmm. putting it in the middle of a business critical workload is yet another. Typically that's inside of a process, could be inside of an application. So right. we've built, as an industry, a lot of the tools that help you build it, the good news is a lot of that stuff is in open source. You could pick it up and readily use it for free. Right. But getting it, getting what you've built inside of business critical uh, processes requires a different dimension of technology and actually forces you to confront the technology and process part of a technology process. Uh, I'm sorry, people technology process part of the problem. We typically are just focus on the build, the technology part, forgetting the people process part. Right, um, okay. Those companies that are putting it to work have actually figured out how to complete that circle for sure. Well, I think I know what you mean when you talk about the people and process part of it. What What, what do you mean? Would you clarify, like, what, what is the people process challenge? Well, I mean, so let's imagine that you're interested in improving your customer onboarding process if you're a bank, right? This right. means, uh, customers coming in, they're asking for a service of yours, typically something like a loan. And there's a very sophisticated set of things that have to be done in order to determine that person's creditworthiness. You have to do right. background checks. 
you have to ultimately determine whether or not that person can get whatever it is they're asking for. You can have technological means for you to do that more effectively. The question is, is that stuff fair? Mm. Is it going to pass regulatory scrutiny if that were going to be imposed on you? Right. Uh, and so, you know, it's broaching the technology, I'm sorry, the people process part of the problem that typically if we're just building a low stakes model that's helping you, you know, pick a movie that you'd want to see, you, you don't have to, you don't have to deal with, you don't have to confront with. This is the kind of right. stuff that in the enterprise, you, you certainly need to consider. Uh, and, you know, I think companies are getting better at planning for that kind of stuff, but uh, it's still a long, long way for us all to go. Yeah. Well, all right. So say there's a, there's a company out there that wants to get started with artificial intelligence and, and they realize, hey, you know, we, we're not going to be able to compete if we don't get on board. And I think there's probably, you know, many, many companies running this boat at this very moment across the U.S., if not across the world. What's the first step for them to get started? I guess it's always going to be define your project, but let's just say we they, they, they've defined their, their project. I mean, what's how do they really get started with, with implementing artificial intelligence? Generally, I, you know, I always tell our customers, if you got a problem and you, it's well defined and you generally know that you want to go explore that, try before you buy. And that comes in two ways. Uh, in, in the case of IBM and in, even in some of our competitors, they're making resources available to their customers, to our customers, so that customers can pick a problem. They could do a short period, um, well-scoped proof of concept. Typically, these things are two, three, at most four weeks. And it's a way for a customer to begin to validate whether or not their underlying assumptions of the nature of the problem, of the outcomes, if that problem were fixed, hold. And they get to try out the tech. So that's kind of a people-assisted try before you buy. We do that okay. through something we offer called the Data Science Elite. And of course, our tools, like Watson Studio, are readily available for free. And any of our customers and any of the users out there can try it out for themselves and go make sure that that problem can be solved with the technology we have to offer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to guess that some companies are going to think, well, that's I'm, I'm interested in that. And they might say, well, but we're going to be confused with that free model because we need some pretty high priced help to because we're going to get lost by ourselves. Is, is there some handholding involved with that? Or what, what do they do if they get into that and they get a little lost? I mentioned the data science elite team. These are PhDs, mathematicians, statisticians, practicing data scientists that are on my payroll that I make available for free for our customers. Uh -huh. All they have to do is pick a problem, make time for us, and we're going to use design thinking to go prove out a solution to that particular problem. And so if skill is the reason why they can't get started, we got an answer for that. It doesn't cost them anything just to try try us out. Interesting. Okay. So, and this sort of really, it, it may even repeat the question, but I think it's interesting. To, you know, where do companies source AI from? I mean, you've mentioned a few possibilities. I, I guess the, the real question becomes, how complicated is it to incorporate AI from a third-party vendor? So, in general, let's, so artificial intelligence could be experienced in, I'm going to call it two basic ways. Okay. There are applications that are completely built and designed to solve a problem, typically addressing line of business needs. Artificial intelligence is built into it. It delivers results without the user or without the buyer even knowing that there's artificial magic behind the scenes doing the stuff. Right. In the case of, in the case of IBM, we have applications that have AI infused in them focused on customer care, Agile planning, uh, content analytics, supply chain, asset management, just as for instance. Mm -hmm. Watson has been built inside. We're doing that to improve the experience, to deliver better outcomes. Customers actually have no idea that artificial intelligence is behind the scenes. It's just making the product, the outcomes better. Hmm. The, okay. other way, the other way is using tools that are made available to data scientists and data engineers to put this stuff to work. So if a company, going back to the earlier example I gave you, is trying to improve their customer onboarding process, digitizing it, making it more, making it more powerful uh, for the company and for the customers they serve, they can build these artificial intelligence models. They can infuse it into that process to improve the process. And they can, they can improve that process itself by improving the models that are underpinning it. And so 
it's kind of the do-it-yourselfer approach here where our data science tools targeted at data science teams can help these businesses improve their processes of all manner by you know building artificial intelligence models and injecting and managing the entire life cycle so um, that's kind of the two basic approaches that they can they can take and you have firms like ibm that are offering techno technological solutions in both in both categories interesting okay well, let's let's look at some real world use cases. I mean, what what are some enterprise problems you, you've solved with artificial intelligence? I mean, you, I wouldn't ask you to, to name the the clients, of course, but can you talk about how it worked and a little a little about the logistics of the use cases? Absolutely. Uh, so, customer care is probably one of the uh, most vibrant applications of conversational AI, which is anchored around a technology called natural language processing. Right. Our, our product for that is Watson Assistant. When applied for customer care, what we're able to do for our customers is deliver a much more delightful experience to the customers that they serve, no matter how they're interacting with them. Mobile phone, web page, uh, virtual assistants, voice, and delivering an exceptional customer experience across all those channels. The additional benefit is because we can do that cheaper, better, faster than alternatives, we're able to save companies like CVS significant dollars that they could redeploy to much more productive use. Uh, and that's getting replicated in multiple industries. That's, that's just one example. Another example that we have is around planning. Every company, no matter the nature of the company, has to plan. They have to create forecasts. They have to create budgets. They have to create operational plans in support of those for things like staffing, demand plans, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the vast majority of this work still remains done in Excel, which is great to get started. But right. if you have fast changing market conditions, I don't know, triggered by, for instance, a pandemic, a hurricane, something like that, sure. these plans can't keep up. And so artificial intelligence applied to that particular problem is enabling these firms and the planners inside of them to incorporate agile planning techniques to their um, to their mission, and it's making them much more nimble, much more adaptable to these fast changing market conditions. And it's uh, it's another major area of investment of ours. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting about Excel. I mean, I recently heard this talk where someone said, you know, as far as we've come with data analytics to this day, Excel is still the leading big data application, which is kind of odd when you think about it. Um, at any rate, the, con the concept of, of, of data fabric, a, a fabric that, that reaches uh, across the enterprise, inside, outside the enterprise, seems like it would be a, a key role with artificial intelligence. How does data fabric help AI move forward? So if you have any ambition to either build artificial intelligence or take advantage of artificial intelligence applications that need to be constantly improved, the basic ingredient for all of that is data. It's what those models are built against, trained on, is how they constantly improve. And so if you don't have your data right, you certainly are not gonna have your AI right. And if you don't have your AI right, you're not gonna deliver the outcome. And so data just as a basic ingredient for most applications of artificial intelligence is just a prerequisite, okay? Right, usually the mass problem, amounts of data. Right, so the problem, the problem with the, so the major data problem that everybody suffers from and when I started my career over 20 years ago, companies were suffering from it then. So the nature of the problem, uh, I mean, the problem has always existed, just the nature of the problem is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It has to do with data silos. It's, mm -hmm. I have stuff, I don't, I can't find it. I have stuff, I can find it, but I can't put it to work. Mm -hmm. The architectural approach that we've been taking to this problem as an entire industry is, give me that data, I'm going to put it in a single place. We did it when I started out with enterprise data warehousing and data marts. Mm -hmm. We're doing it again today using contemporary versions of those things, data lakes, data lake houses, cloud data warehousing. But ultimately, the approach to that problem is the same. I'm going to take data from everywhere it is, uh, and I'm going to consolidate it into a single place and put it right. to work. And that thing, it's just not practical to do that. Right. There's a reason why 70, 80 percent of the data inside of the enterprise isn't put to work. It's because that method can't can't scale up to the magnitude of the problem. What the data fabric does is try to flip it on its head. It says, 
I'm going to give you means to access your data no matter where it is. I'm going to allow you to manage the entire life cycle so that you can improve, understand the quality of it, understand its origin, understand how it's been used, where it's been used, and use that to inform how you use that data and use that to inform on how to improve the data quality itself. Hmm. And if you want to move it, and often you do, there ought to be efficient ways to move it. So the data fabric is kind of like what SOA was for application builders, you know, 10 years ago. Right. It's just offering a different architectural approach to solving the data silo problem. And, you know, Gardner has been tracking it for a number of years. We actually believe in their vision of, of it. And we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is and redirecting a lot of R&D dollars to go offer a solution to that problem through the data fabric for our customers. So among among the things that the data fabric does, it it it, it goes again, it, it, it helps companies avoid silos of information in, in the enterprise. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, let's talk, let's talk to the, um, the the future of artificial intelligence in the enterprise seems like there's going to be a point, you know, three to five years from now might not take that long where companies really will figure it out. I mean, I guess I'd, I'd love to get your prediction of, of where AI and the enterprise is going to. Uh, perhaps a milestone or a trend, what, what, what do you see looking into the future? So right now, artificial intelligence is really being used in the enterprise in what I would consider to be low stakes use cases, right? right? Um, and part of the reason for that is there's not enough capability that we're offering to the industry. The industry, the technological industry is offering to our customers to deal with really nasty, hard topics. If you're in a regulatory industry and you know, you have to defend why certain decisions were made, right. whether or not you did business with a certain company as a, for instance, you better be able to explain how the artificial intelligence powering these systems works mm -hmm. and why it delivered the outcome that it did and what your process was for validating that all of this stuff was fair in meeting your regulatory and compliance obligations that you have as a firm, mm -hmm. right? That is, that's forcing us to deal not just with hardcore technical traditional artificial intelligence topics like do we have the right algorithm is the algorithm solving the problem correctly uh and accurately and at scale but rather how do i facilitate this process of regulatory validation how do i know after this stuff has already been deployed that's performing as i originally intended how do i know that it's delivering fair and balanced outcomes that are consistent with my own ethics as a as a firm mm -hmm. Those are high stakes decision making, and it requires explainable AI tools that embrace that and, and that can adapt to your version of what ethical AI ought to be in your firm and given all of the obligations that you've got. So I think in general for the enterprise, now the technological capabilities are there. This has been an area of investment for us. We believe in trustworthy AI. Mm -hmm. We've optimized our tools for this environment, this high stakes, environment where there's a lot of scrutiny uh, and because of investments like mine and those of even some of our competition it's going to allow us to put this stuff to work in the wild in much more complicated scenarios so i see that as one vector there's some really interesting work right now particularly around large language models which make things like conversational ai more accurate you can use transfer learning techniques to customize these models so that they are uh, taking advantage or their, their understanding business and firm specific specific vernacular and vocabularies and things like that. NLP, you mean, or is it, a, is it a, like an advanced version of NL, NLP? Yeah, I mean, it's basically NLP is kind of the category is just advancements in it, right? So the, the right. language model themselves are bigger, so they're more accurate. Transfer learning is customizing them to firms needs. Like all of this stuff helps us put it to work uh, more broadly. Um, IBM and MIT are investing in neural symbolic um, uh, AI, which is basically taking the best of expert systems and best in some of the leading edge techniques in AI and merging them together. Uh, so it's really interesting. You know, 10 years ago, I don't think we would have anticipated to be where we are now. Who knows really where we're going to be in 10 years, especially with quantum computing starting to accelerate in its development. It's certainly a trying time for the enterprise, though. I think, especially over the next two years, we're going to be putting this stuff to work in high stakes uh environments much more aggressively for sure 
You know, I think it was really interesting the point you made about the explainability because I, I think it is going to be an issue with I mean some of the banks for example that and they they use the AI to, to help them in their loan process so they they either accept or decline a, a loan with someone based on AI and of course then they need to explain why they made that decision right. um, I, and that could be a very sensitive issue based on who's applying for the loan. And I wonder if that's ever going to be completely automated through AI. I mean, I guess the, the model can get ever more and more sensitive, but I wonder if that'll be completely AI independent at some point and, and, you know, for the issue of explainability. Uh, well, I, there's only so far you can go. I mean, just at least when it comes to bias, as a, for instance, there's some obvious things um, that would bias a model. Like if you're training it against a lot of personally identifiable information, it creates all sorts of distortions on predictions that it creates. And so those are obvious, you know, race, gender, age, sure. religion, affiliation, um, maybe some not some some semi non obvious things like where I live and some of the social uh, economic dynamics of all of that. But there's some really non obvious things that you know could be there. If I take this attribute and this attribute and this attribute and I match make it, I know it's Daniel Hernandez. Daniel Hernandez is a Hispanic name. You know what I mean? So there are some not obvious things there. Mm -hmm. Could we apply techniques to identify where there's um, you know, not obvious bias? Certainly we can, we're starting to advance uh, our work around some of that stuff. But at some point there's, you know, I think there's gonna be some human augmentation on, on that whole process that's gonna be necessary. And certainly there needs to be pressure testing to make sure that it works under various conditions, just to make sure that assumptions hold that the stuff works in the wild as expected when it was originally built. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, Daniel, I think you said it. I think uh, you know some some really interesting stuff. Uh, it'll be uh, interesting to keep our eye on it in the years ahead. Uh, totally appreciate you joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, James. Thank you for having me.